Good morning, gardeners, and welcome to Thursday, August 3rd. My name is Catherine, and I created a show called Good Morning Gardeners, even though I can't grow green things, because I am referring to gardening metaphorically. We're planting the seeds for a better day. We're starting our morning by getting in the right mindset to cultivate a better life for ourselves, better communities, and a better world. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you'd like to add Good Morning Gardeners to your morning routine. I do my best to wake you up with positive and mentally stimulating ideas, but sometimes I do miss things. If you have something to add to the ideas I discussed today, please chime in in the comments section below. Today's daily Stoic reading, titled The Good Life is Anywhere, begins with a quote from Seneca. At this moment, you aren't on a journey, but without being driven from even though what you seek to live well is found in all places, is there any place more full of confusion than the forum? Yet even though, yet even there, you can live at peace if needed. The authors add, a well-known writer once complained that after becoming successful, wealthy friends were always inviting him to their beautiful exotic houses. Come to our home in the south of France, they would say, or our, squi our Swiss ski chalet is a wonderful place to write. The writer traveled the world, living in luxury, hoping to find inspiration and creativity in these inspiring manners and mansions, yet it rarely happened. There was always the allure of another, better house. There were always distractions, always so many things to do. And the writer's block and insecurity that plagues creative types traveled with him wherever he went. We tell ourselves that we need the right setup before we finally buckle down and get serious. Or we tell ourselves that some vacation or time alone will be good for a relationship or an ailment. This is self-deceit at its finest. It's far better that we become pragmatic and adaptable, able to do what we need to do anywhere, anytime. The place to do your work, to live the good life, is here. Uh, so, it is incredible how apropos this reading was to my first episode back from vacation. I promise I didn't plan that. Um, I just took a couple extra days off to try and recover from my vacation and to take care of some chores, basically, and it just so happened that today was the first day that I felt I could gather my thoughts in a way that is required for Good Morning Gardeners. The idea that vacation doesn't actually inspire, refresh, or relax us as much as we think it will has been a long-standing belief of mine, so it's quite validating to learn that an ancient philosopher um, agrees with me. While I do think that inspiration can come from just about anywhere, and I personally do become inspired uh, by every adventure that I take, traveling to different places makes it harder for me to do the work required to follow through on that inspiration. Not easier. I actually require things like routine, security, and discipline in order to do the work that I've become inspired to do while traveling. And this is just one of the things that makes vacation more stressful for me. But even though I do think that traveling is difficult, I think it's worth it. And I would love to speak more about this in a future episode, but before I opened up the Daily Stoic this morning, I had actually already prepared a different topic to speak on. This topic is one that I have become quite interested in, and I have definitely touched on it before on this show, but I'm going to come at it from a different angle this morning. It's the topic of speaking out or speaking up for yourself, or maybe more specifically, knowing when it is appropriate to speak up and knowing when it's better to stay quiet. I began thinking about this yesterday morning because I had spent a large part of the day before, which was my first day back at home, taking care of some unpleasant business that cropped up with a dog sitter while I was gone. If you've been with me since the beginning, you know that I have a dog that likes to stay by my side uh, because she used to make all kinds of noise while I was trying to talk to you guys, um, but then I started shutting her out of my office while I filmed and she is currently lying up against the outside of my office door, probably feeling very offended. Um, anyway, her name is Keiko and I got her when she was a puppy in 2019. 
This whole time, past four years, I've been working from home, so I was able to stay with her almost 24-7 until she was fully potty trained. And now that she is a four-year-old adult, she is very well trained in all kinds of things. For my recent vacation, I took a train to the Normandy region of France. I stayed there for about four days, and then I stopped in Paris for about 24 hours on the way back home. For the past two years, I've left Keika with a wonderful dog sitter while I travel, but unfortunately, this dog sitter was on vacation herself last week. So I chose to hire a new dog sitter with whom I made contact in a local pets Facebook group. Near the end of my time in Normandy, I got some messages from this new dog sitter. She told me that Keiko had urinated on two separate beds within the span of 20 minutes while she had stepped out to pick, out dinner, to pick up dinner. Even though she sent these messages at 8 o'clock in the evening, and despite knowing that I would be on the west coast of France that day, she asked me if Keiko could be picked up that day. She then immediately brought up the value of the bedding that she claimed was urinated on and demanded that I send her the new funds or the funds to purchase new bedding. As I'm sure you can imagine, this was an extremely unpleasant set of messages to receive while on vacation. At first, I was shocked that Keiko would do something like that and I became worried that she was sick. But as the dog sitter seemed to be angry at Keiko, and had requested she be picked up, my first priority was to find someone who could rescue Keiko. Luckily, a very generous acquaintance was able to pick her up within the next half an hour or so, and I was able to cut off communication with the dog sitter, who was at that time messaging me very aggressively about the value of the bedding, and she even tried to call me. I didn't sleep well that night because I couldn't stop thinking about this situation, which seemed extremely bizarre to me, to say the least. Keiko hadn't had an accident inside since she was a few months old, and even when she was a puppy, she would never urinate on a bed. After consulting with some friends and my regular dog sitter, I came to the conclusion that this new dog sitter was lying to me. My regular dog sitter and the acquaintance who picked her up both reported that Keiko was very well trained, she seemed very healthy, and she had no accidents inside. The more feedback I got, and the more I thought about it, the more I came to believe that this dog sitter was trying to, for lack of a better word, scam me. I believe she waited until late in my vacation, when I was likely to be distracted and therefore unlikely to closely scrutinize her claims before sending a flurry of messages designed to upset and intimidate me into quickly sending some reimbursement funds for betting. So my first day back at home, I received another message from this person saying that she had Keiko's tags because they had fallen off of her collar. This message only solidified my belief that this person had been lying to me because I knew for a fact that the tags were affixed with a key ring in a way that would have made it impossible for them to fall off. I am certain that this dog sitter intentionally removed the tags in order to use them as collateral. So that day, I took the time to explain to this person in a series of carefully thought out and typed out messages, everything I believed to be true about this situation. And I called this person out on their trying to deceive me. I told her I would pay her for the dog sitting services I hired her to do for the full term, and if I was correct, she didn't even deserve the full amount since she hadn't kept Keiko for the entire duration of the time agreed upon. Um, But my thinking was, if by some bizarre twist I was incorrect and Keiko had had an accident inside, then this dog sitter could use the extra funds to wash her bedding at a local industrial washing machine. After sending the payment digitally, so I had proof of payment, I took even more time to type out an overview of the situation, edit screenshots of the messages to obscure the dog sitter's identity, and post the whole story to the Facebook group in which I had found her. I wanted to warn other people about what I am calling a scam while being fully transparent about my side of the story. 
And this is where knowing when to speak up and knowing when to stay quiet comes in. There was a time when I was unsure whether I should post this in the group. I didn't want to start drama, and I didn't want to be seen as someone who wants to start drama. I didn't know if other people would understand why I was so certain that the dog sitter was lying to me. And I knew that it would make this dog sitter person angry. So for our feel good moment today, I am going to share with you four considerations for when to speak up, which I wrote retrospectively this morning after examining my own process for deciding to speak up this time with the dog sitter, as well as my process for deciding to speak up the previous times in my life um, when I've had some more let's just say serious things that I've spoken up about. So number one, do you have something thoughtful, helpful, and or important to say? You don't have to meet all of these criteria, but the more closely what you have to say matches all three, thoughtful, helpful, and important, I believe the more urgent it is that you do speak up. In my example with the dog sitter, I had thought very carefully about this situation and I felt certain that I was doing the best thing I could considering everything I knew. I also believe that sharing this experience is helpful, so people can watch out for this type of thing, possibly taking some tips from how I handled it should they ever face this kind of situation. And finally, it was important to me to share my experience openly and honestly, because I was aware that there existed an opposing perspective that Keiko actually did urinate on the beds and that I did owe this person some kind of additional money. Uh, maybe this part wasn't important to anyone else, but it was important to me to be fully transparent about my decision process to explain why I believed I had handled the situation as fairly as I could. Number two. Are you speaking to someone who can and will listen? This one might seem less significant in the dog, center, dog sitter example, but when I look back over my life, I recognize this one as extremely important. For much of my life, I've spent time around people who either didn't value what I had to say or didn't care about the kinds of things that I cared about. I have spent a lot of time talking at people who aren't in a place to receive anything but the reinforcement of their own beliefs. This is obviously a waste of time. That's why I love the internet. I can post in a public forum or share a public video like this one, and while it may not land with everyone, it's possible that I will reach someone out there who is interested in what I have to say and is receptive to my ideas. Number three. Do you understand that what you have to say doesn't have to be perfect? It has taken me a long time to internalize this one. Actually, I don't think I've fully internalized it yet. You see, when I was growing up, my dad taught me to think before I speak. The way he did this was to latch on to any mistake that came out of my mouth, whether grammatical, factual, or just a mispronunciation. He would criticize these mistakes harshly, and if he didn't like what I was saying, he would use this kind of mistake to disregard my entire point. It is to this that I attribute much of my perfectionism, which for, most of my li for much of my life has resulted in paralysis. It wasn't until I was 30 years old that I was pushed into a situation in which I felt morally compelled and practically obligated to speak up. The first way I did this was by publishing a letter to my entire extended family. If you're interested in learning more about that story, you can find all the details at findbethandmom.com, which is a little project that I started to contend with my family history and inadvertently uh, used it to train myself a bit to speak out. But yeah, to wrap this one up, um, you know, what you have to say, it just doesn't have to be totally perfect. People who can't or won't listen to you will find any way to dismiss you. People who actually want to hear you will disregard small mistakes as irrelevant because they are. Lastly, number four, 
Are you prepared to receive negative feedback? This one is arguably the most important one. If you've already answered yes to number one, is what you have to say thoughtful, helpful, and or important, then you've already got a head start on this one. Because if you know that you are speaking out for the right reasons, you can rest inside that inner confidence that you have done nothing wrong when the criticism comes in. The dog sitter slash scammer I posted about in the Pets Facebook group was extremely angry at me for sharing what happened publicly, even though I very carefully obscured all of her personal information. She told me that I had engaged in hate speech and threatened to report me to the police. But I know that I wasn't coming from a place of hate by sharing that experience. I also know the definition of hate speech and that it doesn't align at all. And if she were going to report me to the police, although I really don't think she will, I feel confident that I did nothing wrong and I handled the situation the best I could with the information I had. And when I spoke out about my family history, I received some negative backlash that made me feel absolutely awful. There were times I questioned speaking up at all, but looking back at that situation, the hundreds, if not thousands, of positive messages and comments that I received far outweigh the negative. And it is my belief that by speaking up and lighting up this dark history, I have done far more good than harm. So in my experience, as long as you're speaking for the right reasons, any negative feedback you receive will be far outweighed by the positive feedback. If you're sensitive to negative feedback, it can be hard to avoid hyperfixating on it. And this is one of the things you have to ask yourself. Can you remind yourself to focus on the positive? Are you strong enough to stay in your truth? If you're not yet, that's totally okay. You can get there with time. Judging yourself for where you're at in your growth process is counterproductive to that growth. So if you're not ready to speak out yet, maybe you can start by doing one thing to get ready. I am aware that this episode may be a bit longer than um, my usual episode, but I want to quickly squeeze in a learning moment by reading from Past Mistakes by David Mountain. Believe it or not, on my journey to the west coast of France, um, in which I plan to spend a significant amount of time on the beach, this was the beachiest book I could find in my collection to bring with me. Um, maybe not super beachy, but it's so fascinating and um, actually considering the uh, historical overtones of the Normandy region, I'm really glad that I brought this one. This book debunks some of the common misconceptions about the past um, or, you know, false history that has been recorded and perpetuated over the years. One of these is the myth of the barbarians. The barbarians weren't nearly as bad as they were made out to be by history, and as we'll see, they weren't even one single group, uh, but rather a word that ancient Greeks and later Romans used to refer to foreigners. Um, it's very interesting, and I highly recommend picking this one up. I'll link it in the bio, as I always do. Uh, but David Mountain writes, Anyone trying to uncover a more nuanced portrait of the barbarians immediately comes up against a number of hurdles. The first is the very concept of the barbarians as a group of people. The classic presentation of late antiquity is as a monumental showdown between civilization and barbarism. And that's misleading, as it suggests that non-Roman forces formed some sort of coalition or shared a single identity. In reality, barbarian was an umbrella term used by the Romans to denote anyone who didn't belong to their empire. By the 4th century, the word covered a wide range of very different and often completely unrelated groups. Adding to the confusion is the fact that these various cultures have bequeathed very few physical remains to posterity. The Romans, with their penchant for coins, pottery, and massive stone monuments, left an archaeological footprint across almost every square inch of Europe. The barbarians, with their small wooden homes and simpler economies, have in many places vanished without a trace. 
Archaeologists have nothing more than their burial sites to go on, but even these don't necessarily reveal much about barbarian life. The third and most daunting obstacle, however, is the one-sided nature of the information that has come down to us about the barbarians. It's often said that history is written by the victors. In many instances, this is true, and historians can spend lifetimes picking the grains of truth out from the reams of propaganda that make up the bulk of many historic sources. But this rule only works, of course, if the victors can write, and the barbarians have had never so much as held a stylus when they first crossed the frontiers of the Roman Empire. Some barbar barbarian groups, like the Huns and the Picts, apparently never wrote a single word before fading from the scene. As a result, we're left in the curious situation whereby the history of the end of the classical world has been written by its losers. You may have heard the saying before that truth always wins, or something like that. Well, I don't quite agree with this statement. I do believe that the truth wants to win, but in order for that to happen, we have to give it a fighting chance. We have to put the truth out there, and we can't do that by hiding away and staying silent. We have to speak our truths, whether by writing or recording videos or just speaking to people directly. And if you're not ready to speak, I urge you to get ready. For our focus moment this morning, I want to invite you to start practicing speaking your truth. If you have been paralyzed into silence like I was, you will want to start small. This may look like simply saying, I don't like that if you don't like something, or calling someone out on being rude. You could also practice recording your truth in a journal, or a series of recorded videos that you keep private. When you're ready, a big important step will be sharing your truth with someone you trust. And then, assuming you picked a good person to open up to, the validation you receive from this person will bolster your confidence in a way that makes it possible for you to speak up more and more. I hope you found this helpful, and I hope you have a wonderful day. I will speak with you again tomorrow.